All right, we're going to talk about another protozoan parasite now, and these are the trypanosomes. Um, the trypanosomes are a fascinating group of parasites, and I, I won't get into all of the um, intricacies of the trypanosomes, but part of the reason I'm very interested in them is from an immunologic uh, standpoint for a very large unyield, uh, uh, unwieldy pathogen these guys are master manipulators of the immune response um, and they actually can lead to almost like an immune um, like an autoimmune like process uh, through molecular mimicry with heart tissue so you can wind up with um, significant cardiac involvement as a result of a previous trypanosome infection. So these guys are actually really interesting parasites just from an immune perspective. If that's something you're interested in, it's worth checking out. Okay, so it's a protozoan. There are actually three um, species or, sub, well, two species, and one of those subspecies has a subspecies of trypanosomes that cause human disease. So let's start simple. T. cruzi, that's a species of trypanosomes. Then the other species is T. brucei. And then within T. brucei, we have subspecies known as Gambiense and Rhodiense, uh, or Rhodesiense. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about these because they actually do have slightly different presentations. Um, I'm gonna kind of go out of order here and cover diagnosis and treatment first, and then we'll go into clinical syndrome, vector, life cycle, all of that, okay? Um, for diagnosis, it's kind of um, a little bit more complex than it should be. So you can see the organisms in blood smears. So I'm actually, what I'm showing here is actually a trypomastigot um, in a thick and thin blood smear. Um, the blood film needs to be anticoagulated. Um, so you can't coagulate your blood preparation. It has to you know, be anticoagulated. Or you can use aspirates from lymph nodes. Um, you can use serology. I do have that listed here. You can also use immunofluorescence, ELISA. And what I always think is interesting, whenever you have all of these different ways of diagnosing a pathogen, especially one as complex as trypanosomes, it really points out that people have been interested in studying these guys and have developed ways to identify them. So like this ELISA or IF may have been developed by somebody who was trying to study the immune response, but lo and behold, we can use it diagnostically. Um, for T. cruzii in particular, you can actually use um, looking for the organism in biopsy. And that's actually what I'm showing here. So in biopsy, you're going to look for what's known as the amastigote stage. Um, this really only works for T. cruzii, which likes to go into um, the muscle. So this is actually a biopsy from heart muscle. And you can see the amastigote here with all of these um, tiny nuclei in there. Um, there is also something known as xenodiagnosis, which is actually used in um, endemic areas. So in xenodiagnosis, what you basically do is you take um, a piece of the infected tissue or a biopsy and you expose the vector to it. And we'll talk about the vectors for these in a minute. And both of them are vector borne, both arthropod borne. But you would expose the bug to it instead of you know cells or something and then you would investigate the vector for presence of the parasite um so that's xenodiagnosis it isn't often done but you can see it would probably be a very inexpensive way to go about diagnosing this because obviously the vectors are available um so that's one way um for treatment and the treatment is difficult so for kind of acute and lymphatic stages of t brucei gambians and rhodesians, uh, you're going to use something known as suramin. Um, the problem with suramin, though, is that it can't cross the blood-brain barrier. And we haven't spent a lot of time talking about the blood-brain barrier, but this is kind of an endothelial cell network that kind of controls traffic in and out of the brain. Um, it's like the TSA. It kind of says what can and what can go and what can't go. Um, and so since it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier and um, the T. brucei species can cause um, neurologic involvement, we need another drug. So in that case, you can do malarsoprol um, for CNS involvement. 
for T. cruzii, we've got two options, um, benzinidazole and nif uh I'm terrible at pronouncing drug names, if you couldn't tell. But this guy here, um, treatment is kind of limited because these reagents aren't always um, reliable. Um, both of these drugs are actually pretty effective during the acute phase of T. cruzii infection, but less so against chronic phases, which T. cruzii does go chronic. So that can be a bit problematic. All right, so let's go back in time to how I normally go through um, a a, a, a parasite or a pathogen, okay? So we're gonna start with kind of what the vectors are. So these are arthropod vectors for both of them, okay? The tsetse fly, which I'm showing over here, this guy over here, which you can see he's got a nice full belly full of blood. He is the vector for both T. brucei uh, subspecies, both Gambiens and Rhodesians. Um, so that's that's the fault of the a bite of the tsetse fly. For T. cruzii, it's the kissing bug or the reduvid bug. Um, and so that's what I'm showing here. So this is a much bigger bug, it looks like. I, I can't really tell you which one I'd rather run into. I'd probably prefer to avoid both. Um, the infective stage is the same for both of them. It's this tripomastigote, which is what I'm showing here. See this, this big... Um, creature here in this blood smear, that's a tropomastigote. Um, for the brucei uh, subspecies, that's also the diagnostic stage. So you basically take a blood smear and you're able to see the tropomastigote. Like I was saying earlier, for T. cruzii, you actually want to take a biopsy of tissue, particularly muscle tissue, because that's where it likes to hang out, and you can find the amastigote, which is what's being shown here. They have a different... Um, epidemiology, so we find them in different places. So um, for Gambiens, so T. brucei Gambiens, we're going to find that in West and Central Africa, whereas Rhodesians, we're going to find in East Africa. Um, and then T. cruzii, we don't actually find in Africa at all. We find it in North, Central, and South America. Uh, now, North, I'm going to kind of put a disclaimer on. We really don't tend to find it in the United States, but it definitely is... Um, something we find in uh, Central America. <sighs> yeah. It's definitely something we find in Central and South America. Okay, so what does it actually cause? Um, these are two um, kind of aptly named diseases. So for the T. brucei um, species or subspecies, I should say, the disease we're kind of worried about is known as African sleeping sickness. It's also sometimes just called sleeping sickness or African trypanosomiasis. Um, so that's what causes that. Chagas disease is what's actually caused by T. cruzii. Okay, so um, I'm covering them at the same time, even though the illnesses are very, very different, okay? All right, so let's talk first about um, African sleeping sickness, and then I'll move on to Chagas disease, okay? So for the T. brucei's, you've got an incubation period of, you know, a few days um, to pretty much up to a week. Um, the incubation period for T. rhodesians is actually shorter than that of T. gambians, um, but the, the outcome is about the same. In almost all cases, this is a chronic disease, okay? Um, so it, it begins, it's going to last for a long period of time, and then without treatment, it often ends fatally with CNS involvement. And the CNS involvement actually follows often after years. And that is definitely the case with um, Gambians. Um, Rhodesians actually tends to be a little bit quicker about its progression. It's a more rapid disease. Patients um, progress more quickly. And instead of years with Rhodesians, we're talking more like months. It's more like nine to 12 months um, before the patient succumbs as opposed to uh, Gambians. Okay, so how do we kind of identify this one? One of the earliest signs of um, T, uh, of T uh, brucei is actually an occasional ulcer at the site of the fly bite. Um, and what happens is that you get reproduction of the organisms. 
at the site of the fly bite. And then that as that continues, the lymph nodes are invaded and the patient starts to feel fever and myalgia and arthralgia. And you see a kind of a characteristic lymph node enlargement. Um, and what's really kind of the clear cut picture, how, you know, kind of clinically we can go, oh, I think this might be African sleeping sickness, obviously in a patient who has had endemic exposure, is that you actually get swelling of the posterior cervical lymph nodes. So here's one a picture of that. Here's a another one. This is known as winter bottoms sign. Um, and that's kind of what we're looking for. And it's kind of, if you hear winter bottom sign, you're dealing with uh, trypanosomiasis. Um, patients in this stage actually often exhibit kind of a hyperactivity in their behavior. So that's another thing that you can kind of keep an eye out. Um, all right. So then after the acute phase ends, we're going to move on to that chronic phase. During the chronic phase disease is where that CNS development actually takes hold. Um, it basically begins with lethargy, and that's kind of how we get the name African sleeping sickness, is you, you get the, this lethargy, these tremors, and then eventually the patient has meningoencephalitis. Um, you can have neurocognitive deficits and just kind of a general deterioration in the patient. And then in the final stages of disease before the patient um, succumbs, comes, there's convulsions, hemiplasia, incontinence, um, just kind of as that, um, that central nervous functioning shuts down. Eventually, the patient will become somnolent uh, before slipping into a coma. Um, and then death is typically the result of CNS damage. Occasionally, though, we'll see death as a result of secondary infection. Um, so something like pneumonia or even malaria, because this is kind of found in the same place that we would expect to see malaria. Um, okay, so that is African sleeping sickness. Um, we're now going to talk about Chagas disease instead. Um, so Chagas disease is also sometimes referred to as American trypanosomiasis. Now, I want to kind of reiterate because um, my computer became unplugged on the last slide, so I'm a little worried the point didn't get through. Um, Theoretically, American trypanosomiasis can happen in North, Central, and South America. We don't tend to see it in the United States. I, I tried looking on World Health yesterday for, you know, when was the last time American trypanosomiasis was diagnosed in the U.S., and it was kind of like, um, I don't think it has been. Um, so I could be wrong. There may have been the occasional case, but it, it's so incredibly rare. But it's not rare in South and Central America, so that's where we might actually see it. Um, Chagas disease can be really strange. It can be anything from asymptomatic symptomatic where, you know, patients don't even know that they are infected to an acute illness, to an acute illness that becomes a chronic illness. And with chronic illness, that's when it can become fatal. Um, the earliest sign of Chagas disease is actually a Chagoma, which I'm showing here. And what's funny is I look at this and, you know, living where we live in Chicago and being from the Northeast like I am, I look at that and go, oh, is that the beginning of like a Lyme bullseye? And that's kind of because like all bug bites at first to look the same. But what would happen is that instead of, you know, becoming that characteristic bullseye shape, this kind of erythematous um, rash will actually kind of expand and become indurated and can even kind of ulcerate a bit. Um, so you get this. And then what happens next is you get this rash and edema around the face. So I actually think this picture um, here is a little bit more clear. You can see how the, the eyelid is completely, you know, drooped into the visual field. And the lower eyelid is puffed up, actually kind of forcing the eye to squint a little bit. And this is known as Romagna sign. Um, so you've got a Shigoma and a Romagna sign to kind of be your buzzwords for American trypanosomiasis. Um, disease is actually most severe in children under five, um, where you can actually have an acute disease that actually moves into CNS involvement, and that's actually what winds up being fatal for patients. So acute infection is typically characterized by fever, chills, malaise, myalgia, fatigue, the same things that we expect to see with everything. Um, you might be able to see the parasite in the blood during acute infection. And then in some patients, unfortunately, death occurs a few weeks after an acute attack. Um, 
in other patients, the patient might recover or the patient may enter kind of a chronic phase. And during the chronic phase, the organisms actually make their way into tissues. Um, and that's what's kind of, kind of interesting about this one. So in the chronic phase, we actually wind up seeing the parasites um, in the muscle particularly in the heart muscle, that seems to be a place that they, they like to go. Um, we can also see it in the liver and then in the brain, because remember that I, in some of these acute attacks lead to CNS involvement. We can also find them in the lymph node. So um, chronic chagas is kind of characterized by a couple of things. So certainly myocarditis, because like I said, it kind of likes the heart. Um, but on top of that, you should expect to see some hepatosplenomegaly. Um, and again, like I said, you can, uh, you can actually see it in the liver as well. Um, and then you can also see enlargement of the esophagus, esophagus and the colon. Um, megacardia is actually um, something that we see and electrocardiographic changes as a result of kind of these parasites in the heart muscle. Um, if it does go into the brain, you're likely to see cyst and granuloma formation um, as well as meningoencephalitis. Um, so death from chronic Chagas disease is actually the result from tissue destruction um, kind of in the invading organism. Um, and it's typically due to either complete heart blockage or brain damage.